Yorkshire is full of beautiful towns and villages with illustrious histories. We're here in Pickering, North Yorkshire, to visit a very popular and very beautiful church, the Church of St Peter and St Paul. And we're here in Pickering now, which is a lovely and tourist-friendly town in North Yorkshire. And I'm here with Anna Hughes, teacher and archaeologist, Hi. and it's lovely around here, isn't it? Yes, it's fantastic. Oh, now Pickering started as a small settlement on the shores of a glacial lake. It was actually quite an ideal place for the settlers who once lived here, as not only did it have the glacial lake, but it was also very arable land and was surrounded by natural resources. And when I say arable land, it's reported in the Doomsday Book to have had 27 ploughs. Ploughable land, or a plough, was a piece of taxable land which could be ploughed by eight oxen. Now the name Pickering is believed to have come from the old English word Pickeringus, which literally means people on the ridge of a pointed hill. Now after the Norman invasion, it was developed further with the building of a castle and a manor. Now Anna, you know a bit more about the castle and Norman Pickering. What else could you tell us about it? Yeah, so um, Pickering is a fantastic example of um, a, a Norman a medieval landscape, really, a medieval townscape. Um, we know that the church was probably um, established before the Normans arrived, probably um, in the Anglo-Saxon period. We've got some surviving um, Anglo-Saxon Saxon stonework in no inside the church um, that tells us this. Um, but obviously when William the Conqueror arrives and arrives in the north in uh, around 1069 to put down the harrying of the north, he wants to make sure that this area is defended and it is controlled by his earls. Ah. So he builds a castle at the other end of the town where the hill really rises so he would have a really commanding view over this part of um, the county really this is a really really common medieval and norman landscape with having oh. the castle at one end of um, a town and one end of the street and then having the church at the other end of the street so it's really showing his power over the people we've got really really interesting early medieval and early ecclesiastical landscapes so we've oh, wow. got early churches at lastingham which is famous for its crypt it's likely uh, to be the burial place of saint ked oh, wow. um, and then we've also got um, saint gregory's church at kirkdale which is really famous for its um, sundial which probably dates to around the 1050s or 1060s pretty old then yes definitely <laughs> Pickering was also occupied by the parliamentarians during the English Civil War. Following this, it later blossomed into a very successful agricultural and market town. It was also home for a lot of non-conformist religions, such as Methodists and Quakers. In the 19th century, it became a hub for transport, as not only was it the centre of the stagecoach network, but it was also a huge part of the railway system, as in 1836, the Whitby Pickering Railway was established. However, it is the church behind us that is what we're here to visit today. So, Anna, what is it about the approach to the church and about the outside of the church that makes this really special? I mean, this is a great church, really, to tell us about... Um, the history of architecture really it's got oh. some great phases in it which is what we look for as archaeologists we look for um, sculpture and we look for identifying features so the graveyard is quite closed off it's, it's surrounded by buildings really so it's a really interesting approach um, to the church and really draws your eye in mm. um, really to first of all the tower oh, God, um, which yeah. is, is 13th century um, from from the lower stages and then works its way up into the decorator period which is you know mid 14th century some of wow. it obviously we're not uh, completely certain at course, times yeah. when things are built mm. um, but what's really draws you eye to this church is this fantastic porch which is probably 15th century and probably built um, as part of a piece of wider patronage of the church because this church and the town of Pickering um, was part of the land of the Duchy of Lancaster by the um, 14th century so we've got a lot of um, 
money potentially going into this church which we'll see when we go inside. Talking of which, it is the interior design that really makes this a tourist hotspot for people coming to Pickering, doesn't oh, it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's, that is what this church is really famous for. So, the, I mean, the outside of the church, it's a bit of an every church really mm. is what my old lecturer kind of described it as. But the interior is what everyone comes for. Tell you what, should we take a look inside? Why not? Let's go. It's a bit heavy, that door, isn't it? Oh, it's a very heavy door, yeah. But then it just hits you when you first come in, doesn't it? Just, wow. <laughs> You just eyes get immediately drawn to the murals just at the top of, of the walls. Oh yeah, definitely. It is the, the really defining feature of this church. It, the impact as well when you first had when you walk in just draws your eyes straight up to them and these depict some quite horrible scenes so I can only imagine the impact it would have had on someone living in the medieval period just yeah. looking straight at these amazing pieces of art but ones that depict quite gruesome and almost hellish sort of landscapes. Yeah, well, they're really, really kind of lessons, aren't they? Exactly. So, Should um, we take a closer look at them? Yeah, of course, let's go. Let's go for it. This first one, starting with this one up here, which ones did they depict going down? Yes, yeah, so we've got a number of different scenes. So we've got St George and the Dragon first. We've got St Christopher with ah. Christ um, on his back. We've then got Herod's Feast and the execution of St John the Baptist, which is quite grisly. <laughs> um, and then we've got some really, really nice martyrdom scenes. So we've got the martyrdom of St Edmund. The martyrdom of St Edmund is my personal favourite because he just looks mildly upset by the fact he's got arrows sticking yeah. out of him. He, looks, he just <laughs> looks a bit annoyed by it, that's all. Yeah. But then looking at this wall in comparison and this architecture, it looks quite different to this one. So would this have been a different phase of archaeological development? Yeah, of archaeological we've, development? yeah, we've got a different phase here. So we've got a slightly later phase, not much later than the 12th century North oh. Isle. This is the later 12th century or maybe very early 13th century. So um, the real interesting thing about this isle is the beautiful kind of waterleaf capitals. So starting to evolve eventually into what we know as the Gothic period. Of course, yeah. Um, so we can see some of that throughout the church as well. So we can see that Gothic coming in uh, as we go through and of course we've got more wall paintings. Even more, I know it so. hits you, you see these first and then you look up this way. Yeah. So which ones would have been, there, which scenes would have been depicted in these ones then? Yeah, so we've got um, St Catherine um, here, I always feel like it looks like um, it should be in a Marvel comic strip. <laughs> I see it, um, yeah. It's very, very cartoonish. Mm. Um, and then we've got the seven corporal acts of mercy along here. And then my favourite one is this one here, which is the descent into hell, uh, <laughs> which looks quite grisly. And then just on the other side, we also have the resurrection of Christ, telling the parishioners the stories and Aww. helping them. So, um, you know, the quite a visual cue, but we do also have some Middle English um, written um, into particularly the St. Edmund scene. Um, so this is kind of really reflecting the increasing literacy in the 15th century as people wow. become more literate. And would we have known who made them? We don't know who made these. Written records don't often survive. They don't tend to write down who, who made them unless you find um, the accounts. Fantastic. And unfortunately, we don't have the medieval accounts for Pickering Church. Of course. So it makes it a bit more difficult to find It's a bit of a shame, but again, at least we have these to observe and to a treasure as well. Yeah. We have a look down here. There's some things that I want to talk about in regards to just normal churches, such as pews and stained glass windows. Yes. Should we have a walk down? Let's go and have a look. Let's go have a look. One other piece of church history that I find fascinating is one that's always often overlooked and never really thought about when talking about churches, and that's pews. Now, 
Pews were not really introduced into churches until around the 13th century. The word pew comes from the old French word in the 14th century, meaning roughly balcony. Pews were really used as a place for people to start sitting down, particularly the old and infirm at first, but later on the wealthy, when preachers and sermons started getting really lengthy and started to really go on a bit. So people didn't want to be standing around for that long. Now, these pews here, these are from like the Victorian period, these ones really, aren't they? These are from later on. Yeah, they are. They're from the 1880s or 1890s. Mm -hmm. And another part of church history, another part of church architecture that everyone usually knows about, but doesn't really look into the history of, I think, are stained glass windows. So it's been postulated that stained glass was used as far back as the Romans or ancient Egyptians, although it was really the Romans that first started using glass in windows, as before that it was mainly used in decoration. Stained glass has been found in monasteries dating as far back as the 7th century, although it wasn't really added until churches much later on. They were really used to enhance the architecture and aesthetic of churches, but also to tell certain stories. Now, what are the real stories that have been told here, or the stories of these churches here in Pickering? There's some really lovely stories told in this stained glass, but it is actually all 19th century stained glass. Oh. So, in the 16th and 17th centuries, a lot of medieval stained glass was destroyed. Firstly, um, during the reign of Edward VI as part of the iconoclasm, and then also by iconoclasts um, in the 17th century during the Civil War. So much of the stained glass that you see in churches today dates to usually the 18th or 19th century or later on in the 20th century. I think my favourite here is in the chancel. That's actually a really, really lovely depiction of the Last Supper that is dedicated to a parishioner in the 1870s. There's real skill to being able to um, manipulate the glass and create these beautiful, beautiful scenes. Oh, definitely. Whilst this church holds many interesting and eye-catching features, it's worth noting that Pickering is a fantastic place to visit, whether you're a history lover or not. There's the castle and the church, of course, but there's also the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, the flea market, the art galleries and antique shops. The Church of St Peter and St Paul's is fascinating, as it is not only a site of worship, but also a site of great tourist interest and it is a place that has stood the test of time and survived the many centuries.